Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Today we are talking about Robert Liston, who you might have seen his name before if you like to look at lists of crazy history facts. Uh, He comes up on them. (laughs) Uh, He's often characterized as a pioneer in surgery, and when his name comes up, you have probably seen it related to a rather horrifying tale about how multiple deaths resulted from one of his surgeries. Yep. And the speed with which he performed such surgeries, which earned him the nickname The Fastest Knife in the West End. And that might be part of his story, that particular surgery thing, but uh, maybe not. But even if it is, that means that his entire biography as it's carried forward today as a medical practitioner tends to be dominated by the apocryphal events of one day when he, in fact, had a lifetime of achievement and study and teaching in medicine. So today we're going to unpack Liston's career and the way that he approached it. And in some ways, he really is sort of the prototype for that exacting but arrogant doctor trope that we see in fiction all the time. Uh, Because he was exacting, and he was a very confident man. But if he was arrogant, he really kind of earned it. Uh, He advanced medicine significantly during his lifetime. Uh, Heads up, there's surgery talk. Yeah. Uh, We're not going for gore, but just in relaying the clinical details of what was going on in some of these surgeries, it uh, might get into places that the more squeamish in the crowd may not enjoy. Or if you have young listeners, you might want to just preview it first. Again, we're not uh, really belaboring any of the points or being particularly indulgent about them. But, you know, facts of medicine are not always delightful to hear. No. Having reviewed this, what we're going to be talking about, it's it's specific, but, you know, it's not wallowing in the specificity. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a very tricky thing when you're doing this research to go, how exactly do I describe this surgery without being gross, but while being completely clear about what was going on? Me, someone who is not uh, a medical practitioner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and why it mattered. Yeah, I mean, we're going we're gonna to get into the details of all that, but these, these things that came along with his reputation, there were reasons for all of them. He wasn't just like, I'm going to see how fast I can do surgery for kicks. Like, Yeah, that's kind of how he gets portrayed, is like almost a, a... Like a daredevil. Yeah, maniac who just loves to, like, do quick amputations and, like, thinks it's great. And it's, uh, he does want to do them quickly, but there's a logic to it. Uh, And it's kind of a challenge to his colleagues to rise to his level, (laughs) all of which we're going to get into. Yes. So, Liston was the son of a minister and inventor, the Reverend Henry Liston. Robert was born on October 28th, 1794 in West Lothian, Scotland. Robert's mother, Margaret, died when he was just six, and his father doesn't appear to have remarried after that. Liston was very clearly a very smart young man. He enrolled in the University of Edinburgh when he was only 14. That was having only been homeschooled, by the way. And just two years later, he began his medical training. His mentor and teacher was John Barclay, one of Scotland's most revered anatomists. And Barclay actually taught his students outside the University of Edinburgh system at his own private school. Uh, And then in 1804, the university recognized that his courses were thorough and rigorous enough that his students would be allowed to take the school's exams and receive a degree from the university. Liston studied with Barclay for four years, and at the age of only 20, he became the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh's house surgeon. Two years into that job, he enrolled in London's Royal College of Surgeons to further his expertise. And Liston did pretty quickly become a recognized expert in his field. But he also made a name for himself for being vocally opinionated and kind of difficult to get along with. He would routinely and openly criticize his fellow doctors, and he would take patients that other surgeons thought were beyond help. His brash approach to challenging his colleagues even led to a falling out with his mentor, Barclay. In 1818, the two men had an argument, which led to Liston starting his own anatomy class. And that's one of those stories that could go very, like, then he sat there alone in a room, but instead, when he uh, started teaching, he had a packed enrollment of 60 students waiting to hear what he had to say. The ongoing friction that had surrounded Liston eventually led to a change of venue for his work. While he had been practicing in Scotland, his willingness to operate on patients that the Royal Infirmary had rejected had led to rumors that he was 
orchestrating those kinds of things to build his own practice. The accusations that mounted against him of luring patients away from other doctors resulted in Liston being banished from the infirmary for a short time. The banishment was short, but the ill will between him and his fellow medical professionals remained. Yeah, so this next section is um, not entirely documented, so we have to say that up front, but it's an example of some of that ill will. And if it is apocryphal, it kind of is, I think, born of that ill will carrying over and becoming this other story. So there's a surprising aspect of Liston's story during his time in Scotland in that he was in close, close proximity to an infamous series of murders that took place in the late 1820s. Uh, This series of murders, the uh, Burke and Hare murders, are actually the subject of a a podcast by previous hosts uh, here on Stuff You Missed in History Class. So if you want the context for it, you can go back and listen to that. But exactly how close Liston came to all of this is a little bit of a matter of debate, but we're going to give you the, the brief version of it. So these two men, William Burke and William Hare, were both born in Ireland, and they moved to Scotland in the 1820s. In November of 1827, an elderly man died in the inn where Hare was a manager. Hare and his friend Burke took the man's body and sold it to surgeon Robert Knox for seven pounds, ten shillings. And while that first death had been a natural occurrence, the profit that was made from it prompted Burke and Hare, along with their common-law wives, to lure a series of victims into the inn where they got them drunk and then suffocated them. And they continued to sell these victims to Knox, who gladly took them because bodies for research and teaching were in really short supply. Yeah, that's also discussed in that past episode on Burke and Hare and in Holly's and my previous episode on the doctor's riot, like why there was a shortage of bodies for medical study. Liston, who was a colleague of Knox, reportedly noticed that he suddenly had a regular supply of cadavers and he became suspicious of this. The story goes that Liston confronted Knox over this while Knox was in the middle of giving a lecture and using a young woman's body as his illustrative example for the lesson. After the men had words, Liston allegedly knocked his colleague to the ground and then took the body of the woman, who was alleged to be a victim named Mary Patterson, and then arranged for her to have a proper burial. Okay, now, this story is another that seems to have grown a little bit more from his legend than from any actual evidence. There's also, like, a a whole other dimension to it where there may have been some lasciviousness involved in how the body was being handled, and that may have upset Knox. Um, I found mention of this whole thing in a book which indicates that the author of that book was told, follow this logic, about a letter that Liston wrote to a colleague in which he discussed his suspicions about Knox and the altercation and the body of the young woman. But the writer of that book does not appear to have seen the letter itself, so she is going by what someone told her existed. As is mentioned in that writing, it does not seem at all out of character for Liston to have done something along these lines. He was often on pretty poor terms with his fellow surgeons because he was very critical of them, and he had a very strong personal ethical code. Uh, But we don't really know with any certainty if any of this part of his story is true. It's a little earlier than usual for a break, but we want to keep the next phase of Liston's career all together. So we're going to pause quickly for a moment for one of our sponsors. We mentioned at the end of that last segment that we were not sure about Liston's proximity to the Burke Hare murders was entirely true uh, in terms of him being involved with an altercation with Knox. But what we do know is that as a consequence of his general displeasure with his situation in Edinburgh uh, and his ongoing troubles just getting along with everyone there, when Liston was offered a job in London in 1828, he took it. That job was serving as professor of surgery at the University College Hospital. That was a new facility, making Liston the first to serve in that role and consequently very influential in how it was established within the hierarchy of the institution. And it was in that position that Liston truly made a reputation for himself in a number of ways. When you've had trouble getting along with people, it seems really convenient to just have a fresh new start that's not only a new start for you, but also a brand new facility. (laughs) And super, like, prestigious. Like, people are like, wow, that's an amazing job opportunity. (laughs) 
Yeah, so if you listen to our March 2018 episode on Ignatz Semmelweis, you probably recall that he was a proponent of hand washing before surgery and that he was met with significant resistance from other surgeons. But Semmelweis's hand washing crusade didn't start until the 1840s. There were other people that had similar ideas earlier than that. One of them was Liston. In the 1820s, he was already thinking about cleanliness and hygiene in the operating theater. Although he wasn't entirely consistent about it. <laughs> yeah, there's one particular detail. It's like, yikes. Um, but Liston did routinely wash his hands before surgery. And he also put on a clean surgeon's apron before each procedure. And he insisted on clean sponges and dressings that were soaked only in cold water rather than any of the commonly used ointments or other preparations, which could potentially uh, foster germ growth. It's interesting because at this time, there was a little bit of a, a cult of personality around surgeons having kind of like these filthy, gross-looking aprons because it proved how much experience they had, whereas he was like, no, clean, sharp, and fresh every time. Uh, Liston also shaved incision sites before beginning an operation. That was not common practice. And he was on to something with hair removal. Uh, Per the World Health Organization's guidelines, hair removal simplifies suturing and reduces the introduction of potential contaminants. But shaving a site can also cause microtrauma to the skin, potentially contributing to surgical site infection. You'll often see that listed as just SSI in medical literature. And to that end, they suggest clippers rather than razors as a better option. But Liston was removing hair from surgical sites before germ theory had its huge rise in the second half of the 19th century. And his motivation for hair removal and his just proclivity for general cleanliness might have just been a desire for tidiness. But all of this certainly helped contribute to a safer environment for his work. However, he also had some habits that were less than hygienic and were the opposite of providing any kind of sterile environment, including holding his knife in his teeth during procedures, which is unhygienic and also just horrifying. (laughs) Yes, it is. Uh, This is often described as him being, because he was very fast, we'll talk about that in a minute, he didn't want to put it down, and he needed to use both of his hands sometimes, so he would just stick his knife in his mouth. (laughs) I I just watched Tracy get the worst shivers (laughs) imaginable. But as he had been with his colleagues in Scotland, Liston continued to be direct and sometimes brusque with both his peers and the students who worked under him. For students that assisted him in surgery, he could be incredibly harsh if they made any mistakes. Outside of surgery, however, he was known to foster really good relationships with those same students. He would often invite them to his home for meals and have pretty warm conversations. And in these relationships, he was very clear that the reason that he was so tough was because he was adamant that any small error could compromise the patient, and to him that was simply not acceptable. The thing that makes headlines when it comes to discussing Robert Liston is his amputations. There is a valid reason for that. He was very well known for his amputations. He did a lot of them, and he was lightning quick about it, and he also completely changed the way that they were performed. Yeah, I had read one thing, but I didn't find corroboration that he notched that that knife that he used with each of his amputations. Like, he would put a notch on it, and that it was just covered in these ticks. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but this is where we're going to tell you to brace because this is where things get a little bit graphic just because we we want to talk about the technique that Liston used in amputations and why it was different. So prior to him, amputations were generally performed using what's called a circular incision. And so to do this, the surgeon would position his arm sort of wrapped around the limb or extremity that was going to be removed. And then he would make the cut using a circular motion around it, kind of pulling the arm out. An alternate was the guillotine method, which had the benefit of being quick. Uh, But the problem with both of these techniques was that to close the amputation, the surgeon would then have to pull down skin and tissue around the severed bone to suture it. And that could be difficult, and it could cause the patient unnecessary pain and discomfort during an already difficult surgery and healing process. So Liston developed a technique for his amputation that addressed this problem. In his approach, the surgeon would first make a cut that ran parallel to the bone, starting below where the extremity was to be severed. And that way, when he turned the knife to cut through the extremity, he would have a flap of skin left behind that could be folded over the end of the amputation. And that made 
a much more convenient way to close the wound, also less painful. Yeah. And as part of his ongoing efforts to make amputations safer and faster, because we should mention that this was before the use of anesthesia, uh, patients might have sometimes been given alcohol or even laudanum or a bit of opium, but that was not common practice. And we don't really have documentation on which of these patients were prepped with any kind of help in that manner. Uh, But Liston also invented tools to assist in the procedure. So he required a long, straight knife that had both edges sharpened. And while he didn't invent the knife, knives have been around forever, this particular version of it came to be known as a Liston knife. And his other big contribution to the tools of the trade was a locking forceps so that he could lock them down and control arterial bleeding during uh, an operation. And that same type of locking clamp or forcep continues to be used in surgery today. But the real reason that his amputations became so famous was because of how very fast he did it. Again, he was driven by the desire to minimize the time that the patient had to suffer for what through had to have been just excruciating pain while being held down with no kind of effective sedative. Many articles that you see about him will use headlines quoting him, asking those in attendance to time him. Some of his surgeries allegedly took as little as 30 seconds, and he's also alleged to have completely severed and sutured the leg of an adult man in two and a half minutes. He was focused on speed because he felt like the less time that a patient was left open, the less likely that their wound would become infected. Liston was also a very large and powerful man. He was about six foot two and very strong. So part of his speed was just because he could exert a lot of pressure on a cut to do this quickly. And there are stories of Liston being a showman about his work, sort of courting the audience that was always on hand in his operating theater. And he definitely did draw a crowd because his contemporaries recognized his skill and his innovation and his dedication to excellence, and they wanted to see how he worked so they could learn from him. And whether he was showboating during surgery or he was just truly trying to simply show his work as an educational tool to those in attendance is one of those things that shifts a little bit depending on what account you're reading. He was a very confident man, so I have no trouble believing that he was, you know, pretty loud and boisterous when he talked through what he was doing with a patient. I feel like he would fit in well with a number of fictional surgeons on Grey's Anatomy. (laughs) Uh, with a number of fictional surgeons everywhere, right? Like, yeah, he's a little he's a little Stephen Strange. He's a little, yep. like, he's all of them. So there are several infamous surgeries that come up when discussing Liston's work. And this is another moment where you might want to brace. In one surgery, he was removing a man's leg at the hip, and he also removed the testicles as well. And the other pretty notorious surgery is one that is often used as evidence of him being really overzealous. It's an incident in which he was said to have removed the patient's leg as planned, but he also removed at least two fingers from his assistant's hand who was holding the patient's leg. And this story continues that in the long swoop of his cut, he also managed to nick the coat of a spectator who had leaned in too close. So the story goes that the patient and assistant both died of infection and that the spectator died of shock. So this tale is often invoked with a headline involving Liston's 300% mortality rate, but it is also probably apocryphal. Uh, One of those stories that's so fantastic and attached to such a big character that it has sort of gained a life of its own even without supporting evidence. Yeah, so the first of those two examples happened, the second probably not. Yeah, that was an an inadvertent overcut on the first one. And that second one does seem to be, it may have happened, but we do not have supporting evidence. (laughs) What we do know is that even though while Liston did lose patients out of the 66 amputations on record in his first five years in London, 10 of them died, that was actually better than the average in a lot of other hospitals. Like having 10 out of 66 patients die might sound terrifying by today's standards, but it was just way better than so many other hospitals that were performing similar surgeries where there was often a one in four chance that the patient wouldn't survive. Uh, If we also sort of add in the idea that he was known for taking patients that other people thought were beyond help, that seems like an even more positive part of his equation. Yeah, I mean, he... uh... 
there there are stories of people of his waiting room just being perpetually full because people were all very afraid of having amputations, of course, but they were more trusting of him than they were of almost anyone else. And Robert Liston, we should say, was not only interested in teaching amputation, though. He had very firm opinions and a lot of experience, and he used both to teach the next generation of surgeons how to hone their craft. In 1837, he published his book Practical Surgery with 120 engravings on wood, and then it was adapted for U.S. publication the following year. And that was followed up in 1840 by Elements of Surgery, which also got an American edition, but that time it took two years. That came out in 1842. And in his writing, one of the things that he talks about is his three guiding principles of surgery that he felt that all doctors should follow. The first principle that Liston listed was an expert knowledge of anatomy. He believed very strongly that one must study and practice on cadavers before ever being allowed to operate in any capacity on a living person. It's not surprising that anatomy would be his governing guide as a surgeon. The need to know the human body is obvious, but also anatomy formed the foundation of his early studies with Barclay. And Liston's second principle of surgical practice, and this is actually pretty uh, groundbreaking for his time, was to always factor in the patient's emotions. He was very conscious of the mental state of the people that he treated, and he wanted physicians to be open with their patients and fairly transparent, but also reassure them about the procedures that they were recommending and the treatment that would follow. And if a patient was truly filled with dread, he thought it best to postpone or even cancel the surgery because he thought that was only going to decrease their odds of making it through healthfully. The third principle that Liston outlined was the need for courage on the part of the surgeon. There was no place for hesitation in the operating room. A trepidatious surgeon might hesitate too long and consequently doom a patient. In addition to the amputations gone awry that we mentioned earlier, there was at least one other incident when Liston's self-assuredness and his confidence led him to a quick decision uh, with fatal results for his patient. So at one point, he was presented with a child who had a mass on his neck, and Liston believed that it was an abscess. That was his assessment. And so he punctured it with a knife, and it had, in fact, been an aneurysm, and the child died. So it may sound surprising, given his seeming passion for surgery, but Liston was actually very conscious of the importance of trying to avoid unnecessary surgeries. He thought that the ongoing advancement of medical science would continue to allow pathology to better determine which patients would truly benefit from a surgical intervention versus what should be treated with other non-invasive methods. In the preface of one of his books on surgery, he wrote, quote, the functions and structure of parts are more frequently preserved, uninjured. Mutilation is more rarely required. And operations are dispensed with. The wider the extension of pathology, the fewer the operations will be, thus affording the best criterion of professional attainment. Who will question that there is more merit in saving one limb by superior skill than lopping off a thousand with the utmost dexterity? It was totally the opposite of everybody's uh, impression that he was just, like, ready to run with as yeah. many amputations as possible. Yeah, he definitely gets characterized as pretty amputation happy. But in fact, he's like, no, that's the last possible option. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk about an area of surgical work that is rarely discussed as part of Liston's career. But first, we are going to take a quick sponsor break. <laughs> While amputations made Robert Liston famous, he made significant contributions to the advancement of plastic surgery as well. And he wrote about this in practical surgery, particularly rhinoplasty, in a section that is dedicated to discussing the restoration of lost parts. At the time, other surgeons were known to mock the idea of plastic surgery, particularly methods and techniques of restoration that had been developed in other countries. So if you listen to our past episode on Sashruta, you know that Indian physicians had developed various plastic surgeries over the centuries, and many of Liston's colleagues found such concepts to be absurd. Yeah, there was definitely an element of racism in some of their uh, mockery of it. Of those doctors that had been mocking plastic surgery, Liston wrote, quote, put the scoffer in place of the patient. 
Let him lose his nose, reputably or otherwise. Allow him some weeks of consequent misery and degradation. Then bring him into contact with a dexterous surgeon who thinks it not beneath him to make noses as well as stumps, and thereon be little doubt that the rhinoplastic art will have obtained a zealous prostolite. Liston, incidentally, performed the forehead rhinoplasty uh, that was developed in India that we talked about in that Sushruta episode. As was the case in all other aspects of surgery, Liston was exacting in any plastic surgery procedure that he did. He was dismayed that his contemporaries were so sloppy when repairing cleft lips because he felt that a good surgeon should be able to achieve an almost imperceptible scar. And Liston did have a reputation for impeccable work with cleft lip surgeries and established standards for reconstructive surgery at the time that a lot of other people in his field had to kind of struggle to catch up to. Yeah, he was quite ahead of his time in that regard, at least in, um, in Western medicine. There's another aspect of his story which is noteworthy, and that is that on December 21st, 1846, Robert Liston made history as the first surgeon in Europe to perform an amputation using anesthesia. The idea came from the United States, specifically a Boston dentist named William Thomas Green Morton. In a very short period of time, medical professionals in Britain went from having first heard of ether's use to actively using it themselves. A letter from Boston describing its use had arrived in London on December 17th, just four days before Liston's use of ether. In those four days, the doctor who had received the letter, Dr. Francis Boot, and his dentist friend, James Robinson, had put together an inhaler for ether by adapting an existing piece of technology called a Nuth's apparatus that was intended to make carbonated water. Yeah, it had two glass vessels, and they were kind of using those uh, to adapt for the administration of ether. And Boot and Robinson's ether administering apparatus worked, but not consistently. So they worked to improve it. Uh, And this, again, was happening like over the course of 24 hours. And when Liston got wind of what they were doing, he paid the two men a call and kind of got up to speed with where they were at. And then he collaborated with William Squire, one of his students who he had brought with him on that visit, and Peter Squire, William's uncle, to further refine the ether inhaler, introducing regulating valves. In a letter to a friend, Liston described the device this way, quote, It is only the bottom of Nuth's apparatus with a sort of funnel above, with bits of sponge and, at the other hole, a flexible tube. And so on December 21st, Liston removed the lower leg of a patient named Frederick Churchill while Peter Squire administered the anesthesia through the inhaler. Churchill, not related to Winston Churchill, was soon subdued by the ether, and Liston was able to perform the surgery. Just a few minutes after the procedure was finished, the patient awakened and asked when the operation was going to start. This caused the spectators on hand to laugh, and then that made Churchill nervous. He tried to back out of the surgery, still not realizing that it had already been done, and that it hadn't been the horrific experience that he had anticipated happening. And at this point, (laughs) Robert Liston reportedly announced, quote, this Yankee Dodge beats mesmerism hollow. Uh, At this point, mesmerism had been pitched as a potential treatment for surgical pain. It was something that Liston had never believed in in terms of efficacy, and so... He was perfectly happy that he had uh, used ether successfully. It's worth considering that in adopting the idea of using ether so readily, Liston was essentially ending part of the need to speed through surgeries and ending the very practice for which he was so well known. He still made quick work of it. There were still reasons. To <laughs> yeah, he, uh, just as as medical professionals today, he did not want to keep patients under for any longer than necessary. Uh, especially at this point, you know, ether very new. There were certainly some accidents that happened uh, following this initial use. But it was it's kind of one of those interesting things where people talk about him being such a showboater and wanting attention, but then he quickly adopted the technology that, that would get rid of the thing that he was allegedly showboating about. So it, there's some contradictory, <laughs> some contradictory impulses there. Uh, on December 7th, 1847, less than a year after his headline-making use of anesthesia on Robert Churchill, Robert Liston died at the age of 53. In the journal The Lancet, his death was announced with the following opening. Quote, It is with feelings of inexpressible regret, a regret in which an entire profession will sympathize, that we announce the death of Mr. Liston. Our regret is for a great surgeon and a personal friend. 
The profession has had in him one of its most distinguished ornaments, one who, as a scientific operator, had not his superior in this country, throughout Europe, or the world. The announcement went on to report on Robert Liston's final days, as relayed by his personal doctor, Mr. Cadge. Liston had a series of symptoms, all of which seemed pretty minor on their own, including an occasional cough, a fleeting feeling of constriction in his throat, and a slight difficulty in swallowing. He had experienced an incident in which he coughed up blood, which is definitely more alarming, and there was also no obvious source for it, according to his doctors. Liston had believed that he had an aneurysm at that point, but his physicians were reluctant to agree with him. He rallied for a time, and then throughout the autumn of 1847, his health declined until his death. And his post-mortem examination, which is also reported in great detail in The Lancet, uh, revealed that Liston had in fact been right about his own diagnosis all along and that he had in fact died of a large aneurysm near his heart. Uh, So even without in, in any sort of evidence of what was going on, he had kind of intuited what was up, uh, which some people point out as additional evidence of his, his medical insight. Uh, that is Robert Liston, who is, uh, to my mind, a lot more complicated than he did a lot of amputations and killed some people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I, that's kind of why I wanted to, to do an episode on him, because he, I, I often see that headline of, like, 300% mortality rate. And I'm like, yeah, but there's a lot of other stuff going on there, dude. And we don't know that that's true. Yeah. Well, and even just the fastest knife part is, like, he... It wasn't the fastest knife because he was just trying to be the fastest for no reason. Yeah, he was not racing for fun. He was really trying to take care of his patients, (laughs) Uh, which was also why he could be bristly to his his colleagues when he felt that they were not prioritizing taking care of their patients. Uh, He's an interesting, interesting gent. I have listener mail. It has nothing to do at all with any kind of surgical anything that would make you squeamish. (laughs) Great. (laughs) It is a postcard from our listener, Susan. I think, again, the postcard uh, obscuring of some writing always happens. Uh, And it's a picture of Cincinnati Riverboats. And Susan writes, Hi, Tracy and Holly. I have been abundantly blessed. My work took me to the New York City area for four years, and now it brought me back home to a hotbed of history. I would love to see your smiling faces in Cincinnati. uh, This becomes sort of a PSA because we talk about this on the show periodically, and there is an FAQ on our website that mentions it. But I also just wanted to make sure we reviewed for any of our listeners that might not know. Um, we do get questions about, will you come to our town still? And for uh, insight into how all of that works, <laughs> um, we, of course, we want to go everywhere. We want to see everybody that wants to see us. But there are a couple different things that factor into that. One, if it's a tour that we are putting together ourselves, like with our company, uh, those are based on, like, numbers of downloads and and demographic data about what cities we're most popular in so that we can maximize our um, our benefit from that effort. Uh, and then also what the venues are like there. Like if we yeah. have a sizable number of listeners in a place, but the only venue that would really be available holds 2,000 people, like that's more people than are probably going to come to our show. That becomes a little trickier. Yeah, there's, there's like math involved of yeah. like us paying for the venue and whether or not that money would come back, uh, et cetera. It's a very boring series of algorithms. Yeah, and then, like, the travel from one place to the next place. Like, it seems like a very easy thing, but it it, uh, is complicated. It's fun, also complicated. Yeah, the other way, though, that we end up uh, doing live appearances in various places that are not necessarily part of a tour is when we get invited. So uh, if you think that we should come to your area, it's worth uh, talking to the people at, like, conventions or uh, libraries, museums, parks. We've done all of those. Uh, Talk to the people there that book their programming and mention that you would like to see us, and uh, maybe they will extend us an invitation, and then we will come. That is exactly the advice that I give to people (laughs) who ask me this. (laughs) Uh, so yeah, uh, th- those are great ways. If you are in a city we have not been to, or maybe we've been there and you want us to come back, uh, yeah, you could do that. You could uh, reach out to, to places nearby you that might be a good fit for us and see if they would be interested in having us. They may or may not, but that's one way to try to um, stir that whole thing into motion. So 
<laughs> if you would like to write to us, uh, whether you want to stir or an appearance into motion or not, you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also subscribe to this podcast, and we hope you do, on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is that you listen. You can find us on social media at Missed in History. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 